is Dr. Caleb Alexander. Uh, Caleb is an associate professor in the departments of epidemiology and medicine and the co-director of the Center for Drug Safety and Effectiveness at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Dr. Alexander is also an ad hoc member of the FDA Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory Committee. Caleb has served on many editorial boards, including Drug Safety, Medical Care, Medical Decision Making, and the Journal of General Internal Medicine. Uh, Caleb's research interests include clinical decision making about prescription drugs and the impact of policy recommendations on pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical utilization. Today, Caleb is going to speak to us on the topic of clinical decision making about prescription drugs in the modern era. Join me in welcoming Caleb Alexander. No, I'm just I'm just Thanks, it's great to be here, and um, I'm always, as always, I'm grateful for the chance to come back to the university where I spent a decade. Um, I also want to thank the McLeans and, and my fellow colleagues and alumni um, of the center and from the University of Chicago, and also congratulate Ann Dudley Goldblatt on um, such a long and substantive contribution to the center and, and to the broader field of bioethics. Um, some of you may recall my title last year, which was Why 5.9 D6.7 Are We Clear? And uh, this year my title is only slightly less opaque, and uh, that was so that it could serve similarly as a placeholder. Um, I had no idea what I was going to speak about eight, eight months ago. Um, but one, one, what I will focus on today is one important element of clinical decision making, namely therapeutics, and specifically prescription drugs. And there are many interesting elements of prescription drugs that we could talk about, but I'll focus yet further on the cost of these treatments and what's different about the modern era that presents, uh, I'll argue, um, some old and some new challenges and opportunities for clinicians and for patients and for clinical bioethicists alike. Um, speaking of money, uh, this is my, uh, these are my disclosures and my current funding sources, although my, the content of my talk today wasn't uh, supported directly by any of these organizations. Uh, about a decade ago, in fact, when I was at the University of Chicago, we conducted a paired study of patients and providers, and we wanted to see, uh, essentially, uh, examine their, their experiences, their preferences, their beliefs about communication about out-of-pocket costs, and in particular, prescription costs. Uh, this was one of the questions we asked, and once again, this was a paired sample, so that we were asking the same uh, patient-provider uh, duos um, uh, about their experiences with each other. And you can see here that about three-fifths of patients and four-fifths of providers felt that the patients wanted to discuss out-of-pocket costs. Uh, we asked, does the physician know how much the patient is spending on their out-of-pocket cost? And you see that uh, they uh, generally agreed, at least the overall proportions, uh, the answer being uh, most, uh, in most cases, not. And we also examined uh, when was the, we, we asked uh, patients and providers, when was the most recent time, if ever, that you've discussed your out-of-pocket costs uh, with this doctor? And 85% uh, of patients said they'd never discussed their out-of-pocket costs with their provider. And we asked the doctors the same questions, and the doctors said, uh, in, in most cases, a, a, a bit lower, but 65% of uh, the time the physicians reported that they hadn't discussed their out-of-pocket costs. So from these studies, the, this study and then a number of companion studies uh, examining barriers to patient-provider communication and the like, we concluded that patient-provider communication about out-of-pocket costs is an important and yet neglected aspect of current clinical practice. And these insights generate uh, a lot of related uh, ethical questions, and some that are quite vexing. Um, and I'll pose uh, one to you that here again we examined as part of this um, body of work. Um, and, and it's the following dilemma, that is, should doctors recommend what is absolutely medically best for each patient, as if costs were no object, or should they tailor the recommendations based on each person's financial circumstances? And there are a number of different takes on this, um, you know, on this issue. Um, 
hear uh, a doctor is seated with the wife of a patient saying, you can rest assured, Mrs. Wilson, that your husband will receive the best care known to medical coverage. Um, and, and to some degree, this conflict is both old and new. You know, on the one hand, for centuries, uh, physicians have had to make treatment recommendations and decisions cognizant of the fact that these may have economic implications for patients. Um, on the other hand, under indemnity or fee-for-service insurance models, which predominated during the at least the latter part of the 20th century, patients' financial and medical interests were generally well aligned. But during the past few decades, there have been a number of changes and transformations in healthcare delivery um, where we've really entered an era of cost sharing. And uh, these include uh, health savings accounts, um, high deductible health plans. Um, more recently, we have ultra-narrow provider networks. Um, for those of you that are health, health policy buffs, you know what those mean. Um, and the core issue is that a lot of the modern era of, uh, a lot of modern bioethics was developed in the insurance era where the, a normative claim uh, was present that physicians should disregard costs at the point of decision making and with tort litigation posing a standard of care. Um, however, professional ethics developed during the past century, at least in this case, doesn't fit the world of, of modern medicine. So, We've, um, so, so based on this tension, this dilemma, should doctors essentially provide a uniform standard of care or should they tailor their recommendations for each patient based on their ability to pay? Um, really at the core of this are competing ethics, that is an aspirational ethic to treat all patients uh, the same and an agency ethic to be a trustworthy advisor for one's patients. And the real challenge here is that the nature of the agency role or at least the, the, the recommendation that should come the, from the provider uh, uh, with the age, in serving uh, uh, patients um, well as a patient's agent vary as the nature of cost sharing changes and as the nature of insurance changes. And so we've argued that the, that the goals of the aspirational ethic shouldn't be ignored, but nor should they be recklessly obeyed. Um, of course, there are problems with a pure agency-based ethic as well. Um, uh, there are many problems. Uh, uh, patients have widespread variation in the cost sharing that they're exposed to, um, as well as their willingness to pay. Some patients' willingness to pay for a given procedure or test is very different from another patient. Uh, to say nothing of the principles of beneficence and, and non-malfeasance that appropriately provide some outer bounds and constrain uh, physicians' choice sets during clinical encounters. And so we've argued that aspirational ethics must yield uh, to accommodate physicians' agency role in an era of greater cost sharing and that consistent yet flexible recommendations from providers are needed during the course of clinical encounters, um, but that physicians shouldn't abandon their professional standards either. And so, in summary, um, what I've shown you thus far is I've described a fundamental um, um, uh, challenge um, to patients and providers with respect to out-of-pocket communications, and I've also described an ethical tension between this aspirational ethic to treat all patients the same regardless of their ability to pay, and an agency role that calls for physicians to be trusted advisors for their patients, sensitive to their financial needs as well as their physiologic and, and, and met, quote unquote, medical needs. Well, nowhere has this conflict been more uh, uh, apparent in recent memory when it comes to therapeutics than with specialty drugs. And um, um, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the term specialty drugs, I would bet dollars to donuts you will be uh, within the next five years. These are products that are, um, there's no universally agreed upon definition for these products, but they are um, often biologics, that is, they're made from biologic processes using living cells. Um, they are often complex to manufacture. Um, many have unique routes of distribution. They may require cold storage. Um, they, they, many have non-oral uh, routes of administration. Um, and they're often very costly. In fact, one definition of specialty drugs, neither necessary nor sufficient, but I think illustrative nonetheless, is that they cost more than $5,000 for a monthly supply. 
Um, and so for a few examples of these, uh, brand, brand names is what I'll give you, consider the following. Uh, Epigen, Remicade, Enbrel, Avastin, Lantus, Nulasta, Humera, Rituxan, Copaxone, Herceptin, Lucentis, Pegasus, and the list goes on. Um, their cost and financing uh, um, keeps many patients and clinicians awake at night, and dare I say increasingly bioethicists, as they should. Um, so this slide depicts 2011 spending on pharmaceuticals um, uh, in the U.S., and so it's about $320 billion overall, which parenthetically is, is, is more than the GDP of Denmark, and it's actually exceeded only by the GDPs of 33 countries. That is, we spend more on prescription drugs in the United States, um, only 33 countries have a GDP more than the amount that we spend on prescription drugs in the United States. And I'd like to highlight three things. Uh, the first is that we spend a lot on prescription drugs. I've just told you that. Um, the second is that specialty drugs already account for 25% of prescription expenditures. So if you look at the third bar down, um, it shows traditional pharmaceuticals 75% and specialty products 25%. And the third is that by 2020, in just six years, it's estimated and forecast that half of our pharmaceutical budget will be on specialty products. So these are really, really important for policymakers, for manufacturers, uh, for regulatory bodies such as the FDA, um, and yes, for doctors and patients as well. Um, well, manufacturers are aware of this and aware of the burden that many patients face for their specialty products, and uh, I'd like to suggest that the, that, the, that the solution that many manufacturers are using may be where market forces are driving them to go, but may ultimately be eroding efforts to constrain the cost of these products. Ultimately, a shell game, which will ultimately uh, pass on these costs to consumers without tackling the fundamental problem, which is the high cost of these products. Um, so, and, and what I'm talking about are, are drug coupons. Um, this is from a paper that we published in Health Affairs last month, uh, examining the use of specialty drug coupons, and the results were surprising to say the least. Um, focusing just on the last row of data here, all of these products, we examined 10 million individuals and uh, looked at all of the specialty products that they received, and overall there were about 250,000 prescriptions for specialty drugs. And what's important to note is that of these 250,000 specialty drug prescriptions, 40% or two out of five were associated with a drug coupon. Uh, the overall patient cost sharing for these products was 35.3 million. So this comes out to about $135 per specialty prescription, um, and of which 60%, so 60% of the patient cost share was actually offset by coupons. Um, more than half of the amount that patients would have seen and been exposed to out of pocket was offset by coupons. Um, this isn't all bad news either, of course, um, and, and so lest you think this is bad news alone, consider this. Um, so here on the y-axis, we have non-abandonment rates, I'm sorry, abandonment rates, by which I mean um, uh, prescriptions that patients, do, I think this is first fill. So these are first prescriptions for these products that patients never pick up from the pharmacy. And you see here the y-axis is from zero to 70%, and we have multiple sclerosis specialty drugs, and then we have essentially TNF inhibitors, biologic anti-inflammatory drugs. So these are drugs in red for uh, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, uh, psoriasis, and rheumatoid arthritis, I think are the FDA labels. And then on the x-axis, you have the monthly out-of-pocket costs um, uh, 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 spending. So this is uh, from zero to $50. The abandonment rates are about five or 7%. And you see that once you get up to 250 to $500 monthly out-of-pocket costs, the abandonment rates start get, getting pretty pretty high, and here when you're talking about out-of-pocket costs of $750 to $1,000, one in five patients isn't picking up their prescription from the pharmacy. Um, 
Now, I haven't included numbers in this bar graph, but mind you, there are patients with copayments of $500 or more. Um, we increasingly see fourth tiers, so they're standard, in, in, classically in the past two decades, there are three tiers for formulary benefits managed by pharmacy benefits managers like Express Grips or CVS Caremark. There's a generic preferred brand and non-preferred brand. And increasingly what we see is a fourth tier for specialty products, which may have rather than co-payments, co-insurance, where patients pay a fixed proportion of the overall charge. So you do the math for a product that costs $6,000 a month with a co-insurance rate of 25%, uh, we're talking about an out-of-pocket cost of $1,500. So think about that the next time you go to your CVS or, or Walgreens to pick up your next prescription. Um, so these are really tricky um, issues, and, and I think the question is, uh, what do we do about cost sharing in an era of specialty products where many of these therapies are associated with co-payments, and in some cases, as I've just told you, co-insurance, uh, that may simply break the bank for many Americans. Um, and I think there are a number of implications from the facts that I've presented. Now, first, despite an unprecedented growth in generic market share, so generics now account for 80% of all prescription drugs that are dispensed in the U.S. But despite this, despite, despite the fact that there's been huge increases in the uh, market share of generic products, um, the first is that uh, the burgeoning market of specialty products is going to continue to pose economic hardship for many Americans. And this isn't just about cancer drugs. Um, many of the drugs that I mentioned, and indeed uh, the data that I've shown, is not, are not cancer products. So this isn't just oncology, although I think the uh I do have to hand it to uh, colleagues here at the University of Chicago and elsewhere that have uh, coined the term financial toxicity, uh, referring to cancer products that in fact won't just cause mucositis or uh, bad diarrhea and hair loss, but also uh, uh, break the bank. Um, the second issue is that drug coupons remain an empirically understudied and I would argue dubious means to reduce prescription drug costs in the long term. And, and I think it's uh, reasonable and fair to argue that they're pennywise pound foolish since they may promote adherence and reduce patients' short-term economic burden, but they also raise premiums in the long term and they undercut uh, pharmacy benefit managers' abilities to use any economic mechanisms to try to incent patients towards more um, rational or optimal pharmacotherapy. Um, third, this is a really dynamic policy arena. So many state legislatures have passed laws banning um, or limiting cost sharing for specialty products, and you can imagine who the lobbyists are. And there have also been proposals to redesign the uh, Obamacare's health insurance exchanges so as to provide protection to patients facing extremely high costs from these specialty tiers. And there's a related parallel story here about um, oral oncology, oral chemotherapy parity laws. So um, many of you, uh, some of you may have heard this, but in 34 states in the District of Columbia, in fact, these laws have been passed by legislatures. And what they do is they require healthcare insurers to cover oral chemotherapeutics under quote unquote, no less favorable terms than IV chemotherapeutics have historically been covered. Um, this is really big news because the oral Oral products generally have been covered on the pharmacy side, pharmacy benefits, and the IV chemotherapeutics are covered on the medical benefit side. And the, the implication of this is that um, often um, with, the, the, with the oral agents that are specialty drugs covered on the pharmacy side, patients are seeing these very high uh, cost sharing. But as with drug coupons, I think it's fair to argue that such laws are both an inadequate response and ultimately a shell game. I mean, they essentially will pass on the cost to insurers, who in turn will pass it on to you and me, and uh, they really don't tackle, these laws really don't tackle the fundamental um, problem, which is the high cost of these products. Um, in short, the laws ignore the cost quality question. Um, and last but not least, I'd say that the broad deficiency that we characterized more than a decade ago, as well as this fundamental tension between clinicians' agency and aspirational roles, um, is as relevant as ever in light of these changes in the pharmaceutical marketplace. So I think that it's going to be um, a very important and dynamic area uh, for the foreseeable future, and one where uh, I hope and believe that uh, clinical bioethicists um, and others engaged in uh, the vaccine issues can make a substantive contribution. Thank you very much.
take a few questions. Sure. Dr. Alexander's paper is open to questions, September. Hi, September Williams, Ninth Month Consults. This is, uh, uh, I think, related to the topic. Of course, the things you're talking about uh, remind me of the work around um, antiretroviral drugs and how to get access on a broader level around the world. I've recently, because I don't work in an academic center and I take consults from a wide variety of places, often from clinicians and from patients directly, come across a couple of cases where people have been uh, priced out of the ability to cover their immunosuppressive medications for transplant. So this is a special kind of a case. So, you know, a 19-year-old got transplanted. It's 11 years later. She's doing well. She's compliant. She works in a coffee shop. And she no longer has the appropriate coverage because there's a loophole that doesn't recognize these expensive life-sustaining therapies as being important. So when I look at the things you're talking about, I think this is a special case of that situation. Do you know anything about what, what is being done with that and how it might apply to the general case that you're talking about? Yeah, thanks for the uh, question. I'm not uh, aware of specific, um, you know, the specific coverage policies um, in that context, but uh, it certainly sounds to me as if uh, that would also fall into the category of penny wise, pound foolish, insofar as, um, you know, if you think down the road of the implications of uh, uh, organ rejection, they're going to be far more costly than a month uh, or a year or, in fact, a, a, probably a lifetime of the immunosuppressive agents. Um, so I'm not, but I think. Thank you for that, and I think that's um, uh, an illustrative and, and cautionary um, uh, clinical anecdote. By the way, the case came from an emergency room physician who found himself specifically sort of saying to this young woman, well, you have to get yourself back on the Medicaid for some other purpose, so I guess you have to risk your graft, huh. and when huh. you're sick, come right in. Yeah, thank you. I think we'll take one more. We'll, we'll take two more. Hi, Bob Taylor from The Ohio State University. Um, so I, I think the, um, this is, this, I think the problem is that markets and, well, markets and insurance have, insurance has become a market. And it used to be, back in the old days with Blue Cross and big, big insurers, they were almost like a single payer system. They were big groups that, but now we have, um, so for example, with the example just given, uh, not doing the insur not do it, not paying for the drugs now. The cost of that may go to some other company next year. So there's there's no continuity. There's no there's much less incentive for insurers to to avoid future costs. Much more incentive to uh, avoid current costs. So it's sort of like everything's just become a market for the immediate moment, as opposed to. So again, I think the you know the single payer system seems to be the only way that one can get past all of these problems. And I just wonder what your thoughts are. It seems to me the market can't fix this. That's my impression. Yeah, well, I appreciate the comment, and I, I don't uh, disagree. And I think that the, um, you know, we've seen, for example, in, in studies of uh, offsets associated with Medicare Part D, um, that there are some Medicare Part D uh, providers that cover both medical and pharmacy benefits. And indeed, we've identified uh, savings on the medical side from covering, um, uh, from providing prescription drug coverage, and that incense, um, incense that type of uh, provision. So, um, you know, I think that uh, it, it's not dissimilar from settings where you look at something like tobacco cessation and the public health benefits from that and the fact that it accrues long term and maybe to different parties than are covering the, the cessation therapy in the first place. Um, so, you know, without getting into, um, you know, sort of lengthy discussion of, of the way that insurance policies are designed and bundled, I, I think you raise a fair enough um, point about uh, that the responsibility for the bad outcomes that may come from, um, uh, from poor patient adherence or access to pharmacotherapies may not accrue to the people that are on the hook for the bill for the drugs in the first place. We'll take these final two questions, Peter and then Owen. Yeah, um, I, I wonder, I think this is becoming, the, the need to discuss cost, I think it's becoming inevitable. We just finished looking at about 2,000 physician-patient encounters 
a third in breast cancer, a third in rheumatoid arthritis, another, and a third in uh, depression. And we find between 20 and 34% of the encounters, there's some discussion of healthcare costs. So I think even from based on your survey, I think it's becoming more and more common. And, and one of the things that comes up a lot is the coupons. I wonder if you quickly say, uh, this is, is this the way to get people on a drug that they will then later pay for, or w what's going on with these? Yeah, well, it's, I'm, I'm heartened to hear that based on your empiric findings, and actually there's remarkable paucity of research examining drug coupons, partly because the data just ain't there in the public domain. So, um, you know, I think manufacturers are pretty smart with their marketing campaigns, um, but I, I, I've not seen anything more than three or four pithy commentaries in JAMA and the New England Journal of Medicine about drug coupons. Um, looking empirically at when they're used and what their impact is. On the other hand, you've got to think that if manufacturers are footing the bill, that they're paying for themselves over the long term. So, thanks. Hi, Alwan Han. I'm, I'm an oncologist, so we have these issues quite a bit. And sometimes we're faced with um, having to choose between an oral medication that has a lot of out-of-patient cost to the patient versus an IV medication, which does not have an out-of-patient cost, but has logistical time away from work and family cost. Has there been any look at how patients value either money out of pocket versus time away from family and work and um, time in the infusion chair? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, and so the oral parity laws, of course, will help take care of that uh, divide, right, so that have been passed in 34 states where, where the oral drugs are required to be covered under no less favorable terms. With that said, it doesn't sound like that's uh, yet passed here or been implemented um, in, in Illinois. Um, I'm not aware of that literature. I'm sure that people are working on it, and I think it's a very reasonable point. I mean, uh, so there's a big difference between coming in for a 48-hour infusion versus uh, taking a pill each morning. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, economists would have a field day with modeling kind of the, 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 um, the cost effectiveness and, 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 and the cost benefit uh, trade-offs of those types of um, um, alternative treatment strategies. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark.